The Magic Pudding being the Adventures of Bunny of Bluegum by Norman Lindsay. This is a very funny book about a very peculiar pudding. In spite of the word magic in the title, there are no fairies or spells, only a pudding. Sometimes it was a rich odiferous steak and kidney pudding. Sometimes it was boiled jam roll or apple dumpling. All you had to do was whistle twice, turn the pudding round and you could have whatever you wanted. Indeed, the pudding was such a prize that there were professional pudding owners and, alas, professional pudding thieves. One of the owners was Sam Sornoff, whose feet were sitting down while his body was standing. He was a penguin, although Bill was just an ordinary small man with a large hat. The pudding had his own views and was apt to sing in a very gruff voice, Oh, who would be a puddin, a puddin in a pot? A puddin which is stood on, a fire which is hot. Oh, sad indeed the lot of puddins in a pot. For ages 8 to 80, allowing for brief blind periods now and again in between. This is a frontways view of Bunyip Bluegum and his uncle Wattleberry. Bunyip Bluegum, a koala, is dressed in his Sunday best with check trousers and a little straw boater hat and his uncle Wattleberry is wearing a dark suit, carrying an umbrella and wearing a black top hat. At a glance you can see what a fine round splendid fellow, fellow Bunyip Bluegum is without me telling you. At a second glance you can see that the uncle is more square than round and that his face has whiskers on it. Looked at sideways, you can still see what a Spaniard fellow Bunyip is, though you can only see one of his uncle's whiskers. Observed from behind, however, you completely lose sight of the whiskers, and so fail to realise how immensely important they are. In fact, these very whiskers were the chief cause of Bunyip's leaving home to see the world. For, as he often said to himself, Whiskers alone are bad enough, attached to faces, coarse and rough, but how much greater their offence is when stuck on uncle's countenances. <clears throat> the plain truth was that Bunyip and his uncle lived in a small house in a tree and there was no room for the whiskers. What was worse, the whiskers were red and they blew about in the wind and Uncle Wattleberry would insist on bringing them to the dinner table with him where they got into the soup. Bunyip Bluegum was a tidy bear and he objected to whisker soup. So he was forced to eat his meals outside, which was awkward. And besides, lizards came and borrowed his soup. His uncle refused to listen to reason on the subject of his whiskers. It was quite useless giving him hints, such as presents of razors and scissors and boxes of matches to burn them off. On such occasions he would remark, Shaving may add an air that's somewhat brisker. For dignity, commend me to the whisker. Or when more deeply moved, <clears throat> he would exclaim, as noble thoughts the inward being grace, so noble whiskers dignify the face. Prayers and entreaties to remove the whiskers being of no avail, Bunyip decided to leave home without more ado. The trouble was that he couldn't make up his mind whether to be a traveller or a swagman. You can't go about the world being nothing, but if you are a traveller you have to carry a bag well, if you're a swagman, you have to carry a swag. And the question is, which is the heavier? At length, he decided to put the matter before Egbert Rumpus Bumpus, the poet, and ask his advice. <clears throat> he found Egbert busy writing poems on a slate. He was so busy that he only had time to sing out, Don't inter interrupt the poet, friend, until his poem's at an end. And he went on writing harder than ever. He wrote all down one side of the slate and all up the other and then remarked, as there's no time to finish that, the hour has come to have our chat. Be quick, my friend, your business state, before I take another slate. The 
fact is, said Bunyip, I have decided to see the world and I cannot make up my mind whether to be a traveller or a smokeman. Which would you advise? <clears throat> then said the poet, As you've no bags, tis plain to see a traveller you cannot be. And as a swag you haven't either, you cannot be a swagman neither. For travellers <clears throat> must carry bags and swagmen have to hump their swags like bottleos or ragmen. And as you have neither swag nor bag, you must remain a simple wag and not a swag or bagman. <clears throat> Dear me, said Bunyip Bluegum, I never thought of that. What must I do in order to see the world without carrying swags or bags? The poet thought deeply, put on his eyeglass and said impressively, Take my advice, don't carry bags, for bags are just as bad as swags. They never made to measure. To see the world, your simple trick is but to take a walking stick. Assume an air of pleasure and tell the people near and far you stroll about because you are a gentleman of leisure. You've solved the problem, said Bunyip Bluegum, and wringing his friend's hand, he ran straight home, took his uncle's walking stick, and assuming an air of pleasure, set off to see the world. He found a great many things to see, such as dandelions and ants, and traction engines and bolting horses, furniture being removed, besides being kept busy raising his hat and passing the time of day with people on the road, for he was a very well-bred young fellow, polite in his manners, graceful in his attitudes, and able to converse on a great variety of subjects, having read all the best Australian poets. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in the hurry of leaving home, he had forgotten to provide himself with food, and at lunchtime found himself attacked by the pangs of hunger. Dear me, he said, I feel quite faint. I had no idea that one's stomach was so important. I have everything I require except food. But without food, everything is rather less than nothing. I've got a stick to walk with. I've got a mind to think with. I've got a voice to talk with. I've got an eye to wink with. I've got lots of teeth to eat with. A brand new hat to bow with a pair of fists to beat with, a rage to have a row with. No joy it brings to have indeed a lot of things one does not need. Observe my doleful plight, for here am I without a crumb to satisfy a raging tum. Oh, what an oversight! As he was indulging in these melancholy reflections, he came round a bend in the road and discovered two people in the very act of having lunch. These people were none other than Bill Barnacle the sailor and his friend Sam Sornoff the penguin bold. Bill was a small man with a large hat, a beard half as large as his hat and feet half as large as his beard. Sam Sornoff's feet were sitting down and his body was standing up because his feet were so short and his body so long that he had to do both together. They had a pudding in a basin and the smell that arose from it was so delightful that Bunyip Bluegum was quite unable to pass on. Pardon me, he said, raising his hat, but am I right in supposing that this is a steak and kidney pudding? At present it is, said Bill Barnacle. It smells delightful, said Bunyip Bluegum. It is delightful, said Bill, eating a large mouthful. Bunyip Bluegum was too much of a gentleman to invite himself to lunch, but he said carelessly, Am I right in supposing that there are onions in this pudding? Before Bill could reply, a thick, angry voice came out of the pudding, saying, Onions, bunions, corns and crabs, whiskers, wheels and handsome cabs, beef and bottles, beer and bones, Give him a feed and end his groans. Albert, Albert, said Bill to the puddin. Where's your manners? Where's yours, said the puddin rudely. 
guzzling away there and never so much as offering this stranger a slice. There you are, said Bill. There's nothing this puddin' enjoys more than offering slices of himself to strangers. How very polite of him, said Bunyip. But the puddin' replied loudly, Politeness be sugared, politeness be hanged, politeness be jumbled and tumbled and banged. It's simply a matter of putting on pace Politeness has nothing to do with the case. Always anxious to be eaten, said Bill. That's this puddin's mania. Well, to oblige him, I ask you to join us at lunch. Delighted, I'm sure, said Bunyip, seating himself. There's nothing I enjoy more than a good go in at a steak and kidney pudding in the open air. Well said, remarked Sam, sort of patting on the back. Hearty eaters are always welcome. You'll enjoy this puddin, said Bill, handing him a large slice. This is a very rare puddin. It's a cut and come again puddin, said Sam. It's a Christmas steak and apple dumpling puddin, said Bill. It's a... Shall I tell him? he asked, looking at Bill. Bill nodded, and the penguin leaned across to Bunyip Bluegum and said in a low voice, it's a magic puddin. No whispering, shouted the puddin angrily. Speak up, don't strain a puddin's ears at the meal table. No harm intended, said Albert. Sam, I was merely remarking how well the crops are looking. Call him Albert when addressing him, he added to Bunya Bluegum. It soothes him. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Albert, said Bunya. No soft soap from total strangers, said the puddin' rudely. Don't take no notice of him, mate, said Bill. That's only his rough and ready way. What this puddin' requires is politeness and constant eating. They had a delightful meal, eating as much as possible, for whenever they stopped eating, the pudding sang out, Eat away, chew away, and munch and bolt and guzzle. Never leave the ta table till you're full up to the muzzle. But at length they had to stop, in spite of these encouraging remarks, and as they refused to eat any more, the pudding got out of his basin, remarking, If you won't eat any more, he's giving you a run for the sake of exercise. And he set off so swiftly on a pair of extremely thin legs that Bill had to run like an antelope to catch him up. My word, said Bill, when the pudding was brought back, you have to be as smart as paint to keep this pudding in order. He's that artful, lawyers couldn't manage him. Put your hat on, Albert, like a little gentleman, he added, placing the basin on his head. He took the puddin's hand, Sam took the other, and they all set off along the road. A pe peculiar thing about the puddin was that, though they all had a great many slices of him, there was no sign of the place whence the slices had been cut. That's where the magic comes in, explained Bill. The more you eat, the more you get. Cut and come again is his name, and cut and come again is his nature. Me and Sam has been eaten away at this puddin' for years, and there's not a mark on him. Perhaps, he added, you would like to hear how we came to own this remarkable puddin'. Nothing would please me more, said Bunya Bluegum. In that case, said Bill, let her go for a song. Ho, oh, the cook of the saucy sausage was a fellow called Curry and Rice, a son of a gun as fat as a ton, with a face as round as a hot cross bun, or a barrel, to be precise. One winter's morn, as we rounds the horn, a rollin' homeward bound, we strikes on the ice, goes down in a trice, and all on board but curry and rice, and me and Sam is drowned. For Sam and me and the cook, you see, we climbs on a lump of ice, and there in the sleet we suffered a treat for several months from frozen feet, with nothing at all but ice to eat, and ice does not suffice. And Sam and me, we couldn't agree with the cook at any price. We were both as thin as a piece of tin, while there was the cook was busting his skin on nothing to eat but ice. Says Sam to me, it's a mystery, more deep than words can utter. Whatever we do, here's me and you, 
us both as thin as Irish stew, while he's as fat as butter. But late one night, we wakes in fright, to see by a pale blue flare, that cook has got in a phantom pot a big blunt duff and a rump steak hot, and the guzzling wizened is eating the lot on top of the iceberg bare. There's a verse left out here, said Bill, stopping the song. Owing to the difficulty of explaining exactly what happened when me and Sam discovered the, the deceitful nature of that cook, the next verse is as follows. Now Sam and me can never agree what happened to curry and rice. The whole affair is shrouded in doubt. But the night was dark and the flare went out. And all we heard was a startled shout. Though I think myself in the subsequent rout, that us being thin and him being stout, in the middle of pushing and shoving about, he must have fell off the ice. That won't do, you know, began the puddin', but Sam said hurriedly, it was very dark and there's no saying at this date what happened. Yes, there is, said the puddin', for I had my eye on the whole affair and it's my belief that if he hadn't been so round, You'd have never rolled him off the iceberg, for you was both singing out Yo Heave Ho for half an hour, and him trying to hold on to Bill's beard. In the haste of the moment, said Bill, he may have got a bit of a shove, for the ice being slippy, and us being justly enraged, and him being as round as a barrel, he may, as I said, have been too fat to save himself from rolling off the iceberg. The point, however, is immaterial to our story which concerns this puddin'. And this puddin', said Bill, patting him on the basin, was the very puddin' that Curry and Vice invented on the iceberg. He must have been a very clever cook, said Bunyip. He was, poor fella, he was, said Bill, greatly affected. <clears throat> For plum duff or Irish stew, there wasn't his equal in the land. But enough of these sad subjects. It wasn't only to explain that me and Sam got off the iceberg on a homeward bound chicken coop, landed on Terra del Fuego, walked on walked to Valparaiso, and so got home. I will proceed to enliven the occasion with the ballad of the Bosun's Bride. And without more ado, Bill, who had one of those beef and thunder voices, roared out, Ho aboard the salt junk Sarah, we was rolling homeward bound when the boatswain's bride fell over the side and very near got drowned. Rollin' home, rollin' home, rollin' home across the foam. She had to swim to save her glim and catch us rollin' home. It was a very long song. So the rest of it is left out here, but there was a great deal of rolling and roaring in it and they all joined in the chorus. They were all singing away at the top of their pipe, as Bill called it, when round the bend in the road, came on two low-looking persons hiding behind a tree. One was a possum with one of those sharp, snooting, snouting sort of faces and the other was a bulbous, boozy-looking wombat in an old, long-tailed coat and a hat that marked him down as a man you couldn't trust in the fowl yard. They were busy sharpening up a carving knife on a portable grindstone but the moment they caught sight of the travellers, the possum whipped the knife behind him and the wombat put his hat over the grindstone. Bill Barnacle flew into a passion at these signs of treachery. I see you there, he shouted. You can't see all of us, shouted the possum, and the wombat added, cause why some of us is behind the tree. Bill led the others aside in order to hold a consultation. What on earth's to be done, he said. We shall have to fight them as usual, said Sam. Why do you have to fight them, asked Bunyip Bluegum. Because they're after our puddin', said Bill. They're after our puddin', explained Sam, because they're professional puddin' thieves. And we're professional puddin' owners, said Bill. We have to fight them on principle. The fighting, he added, is a mere flea bite, as the saying goes. The trouble is, what's to be done with the puddin'? While you do the fighting, said Bunyip bravely, I shall mind the puddin'. Trouble is, said Bill, that this is a very secret, crafty puddin', and if he wasn't up to his games, he'd be asking you to look at a spider and then run away while your back is turned. 
That's right, said the puddin' gloomily. Take a puddin's character away. Don't mind his feelings. We don't mind your feelings, Albert, said Bill. What we mind is your treacherous abbots. But Bunyip Bluegum said, Why not turn him upside down and sit on him? What a brutal suggestion, said the puddin'. But no notice was taken of his objections, and as soon as he was turned safely upside down, Bill and Sam ran straight at the puddin' thieves and commenced sparring up at them with the greatest activity. Put him up, you puddin' snatchers, shouted Bill. Don't keep us sparring up here all day. Come out and take your gruel while you've got the chance. The possum wished to turn the matter off by saying, I see the price of eggs has gone up again. But Bill gave him a punch on the snout that bent it like a carrot and Sam caught the wombat such a flip with his flapper that he gave in at once. I shan't be able to fight any more this afternoon, said the wombat, as I've got sore feet. The possum said hurriedly, we should, well, we should be late for that appointment. And they took their grindstone and off they went. But when they were a safe distance away, the possum sang out, You'll repent this conduct. You'll repent bending a man's snout so that he can hardly see over it, let alone breathe through it with comfort. And the wombat added, For shame, flapping a man with sore feet. We laugh with scorn at threats, said Bill, and he added as a warning, I don't repent a snout that's bent, and if again I tap it, oh, with a clout I'll bend that snout with force enough to snap it. And Sam added, for the wombat's benefit, I take no shame to fight the lame when they deserve to cop it, so do not try to pipe your eye, or with my flip I'll flop it. The puddin' thieves disappeared over the hill, and as the evening happened to come down rather suddenly at that moment, Bill said, Business being over for the day, now's the time to set about making the campfire. This was a welcome suggestion, for as all travellers know, if you don't sit by a campfire in the evening, you have to sit by nothing in the dark, which is the most unsociable way of spending your time. They found a comfortable nook under the hedge where there was plenty of dry leaves to rest on. And there they built a fire and put the billy on and made tea. The tea and sugar and three tin cups and half a pound of mixed biscuits were brought out of the bag by Sam, while Bill cut slices of steak and kidney from the puddin. After that, they had boiled jam roll and apple dumplings, as the fancy took them. For if you wanted a change of food from the puddin, all you had to do was to whistle twice and turn the basin round. After they'd eaten as much as they wanted, the things were put away in the bag and they settled down comfortably for the evening. This is what I call grand, said Bill, cutting up his tobacco. Full and plenty to eat, pipes going, and the evening's enjoyment before us. Tune up on the mouth organ, Sam, and off she goes with a song. They had a mouth organ in the bag, which they took turns playing, and Bill led off with a song which he said was called Spanish Gold. When I was young, I used to hold, I'd run away to sea, and be a pirate brave and bold on the coast of Caribbee. For I says to myself, I'll fill my hold with Spanish silver and Spanish gold, and out of every ship I sink, I'll collar the best of food and drink. For Caribbee or Barbary, or the shares, shores of South America, are all the same to a pirate bold whose thoughts are fixed on Spanish gold. So one fine day I runs away, a pirate for to be, but I found there was never a pirate left on the coast of Caribbee. For pirates go, but the next of kin are merchant captains hard as sin, and merchant mates as hard as nails, aboard of every ship that sails. And I worked aloft, and I worked below, I worked wherever I had to go, and the winds blew hard, and the winds blew cold, and I says to myself as the ship she rolled, O Car Caribbee, O Barbary, O shores of South America, Oh, never go there, if the truth be told. You'll get more kicks than Spanish gold. And that's the truth, mate, said Bill to Bunyip Bluegum. There ain't no pirates nowadays at sea, except Western Ocean first mates. And many's the bootin' I've had for not taking in the slack of the topsail halyards fast enough to suit their fancy. It's a hard life, the sea, and Sam here will bear me out when I say than being hit on the head with a belaying pin while trying to pick up the weather earrings 
is an experience no man wants twice. But turn up and a song all round. I shall sing you the penguin bold, said Sam, and striking a graceful attitude, he sang this song. To see the penguin out at sea and watch how he behaves would prove that penguins cannot be and never shall be slaves. You haven't got a notion how penguins brave the ocean and laugh with scorn at waves. To see the penguin at his ease performing fearful larks with stingeries of all degrees as well as whales and sharks, the sight would quickly let you know the great contempt that penguins show for stingeries and sharks. Oh, see the penguin as he goes a turning Catherine wheels without repose upon the nose of walruses and seals. But bless your heart, a penguin feels supreme contempt for foolish seals while he never fails where'er he goes to turn backflips on a walrus nose. It's all very fine, said the puddin' gloomily, singing around the joys of being penguins and pirates, but how'd you like to be a puddin' and be eaten all day long? And in a very gruff voice, he sang as follows. Oh, who would be a puddin', a puddin' in a pot, a puddin' which is stood on, a fire which is hot. Oh, sad indeed the lot of puddin's in a pot. I wouldn't be a puddin' if I could be a bird. If I could be a wooden doll, I wouldn't say a word. Yes, I have often heard it's grand to be a bird. But as I am a puddin', a puddin' in a hot, I hope you get the stomach ache for eating me a lot. I hope you get it hot, you puddin' eat a lot. Very well sung, Albert, said Bill encouragingly, though you're a trifle husky in your undertones, which is no doubt due to the gravy in your innards. However, as a reward for being a bright little fella, we shall have a slice of your round before turning in for the night. So they whistled up the plum duff side of the puddin' and had supper. When that was done, Bill stood up and made a speech to Bunyip Bluegum. I am now about to put before you an important proposal, said Bill. Here you are, a young, intelligent fellow, going about seeing the world by yourself. Here is Sam and me, two as fine fellows as ever walked, going about the world with a puddin. My proposal to you is, join us and become a member of the Noble Society of Puddin Owners. The duties of the society, went on Bill, are light. The members are required to wander along the roads, indulging in conversation, song and story, eaten at regular intervals at the puddin'. And now what's your answer? My answer, said Bunyip Bluegum, is done with you. And shaking hands warmly all around, they loudly sang the puddin' owner's anthem. The solemn word is plighted, the solemn told is, tale is told. We swear to stand united, three puddin' owners bold. When we rage, when we with rage assemble, let puddin' snatchers groan, let puddin' burglars tremble, they'll ne'er our puddin' own. Hurrah for puddin' ownin', hurrah for friendship's hand, the puddin' thieves are groanin' to see our noble band. Hurrah we'll stick together and always bear in mind to eat our puddin' gallantly whenever we're inclined. Having given three rousing cheers, they shook hands once more and turned in for the night. After such a busy day, walking, talking, fighting, singing and eating puddin', they were all asleep in a pig's whisper. <laughs>